Good morning, everybody. Okay, the clicker works. All right. We would like to talk to you this morning about this statement and why it's important. UDL is not something, is not what you do, it's how you think about what you do. And we want to talk about what are the implications of this statement for you as a teacher, a teacher trainer, an administrator, or a researcher, or a policymaker. And we're going to start with the case study of Kim St. John's Social Studies Classroom. Good morning. I'm a case study. I've never referred myself as that before. That's exciting. Um, anyway, good morning again. My name is Kim St. John. As they said, I'm the staff development teacher at Rosa Parks Middle School. But when we started our work with UDL, I was a sixth grade social studies teacher. UDL came to our school through way of a grant that our school applied and received that brought Hyatt into our building to give us professional development, specifically to a cohort of teachers. I was actually not part of that original cohort. But when I first heard about UDL, I was really excited. I thought it was about differentiation, and I was on board because my classes, I strive so hard to make my classes artsy, active, fun, and I thought that's what it meant. But as I went through, I realized that UDL was about more. It was about those paths to learning. It was about giving students ownership. And I realized that even though my class was active and artsy and all those things, that there still was only one path to the learning. And it was a path that looked surprisingly a lot like the way that I learned. So I decided that I need to go a little bit deeper. I realized that if I was going to put UD on my classroom, I was going to have to try to give some ownership to students. Now I started by trying to put in some strategies. I started adding images in. I started at more frequently. I started adding in technology. Low hanging fruit, as Bill McGrath would say. But as I did that, I realized that I really needed to take it to a deeper level to give my students ownership, and I needed to give up control. But I was really nervous about taking that leap because I always felt so accountable as a teacher to parents, to administrators, to anybody, to be able to explain that this is what I had put in place and this is the path that students took to prove that they had had the learning. But I realized by holding on to that, I wasn't giving my students the ownership that I was trying to give them. And that, that wasn't benefiting them at all. So I took a deep breath and said, okay, I need to hand over the keys. This means I need to give up control. That is not like me at all. Ask my husband. <laughs> but anyways, I took a deep breath and stepped in. There we go. I started with low risk stuff. I said, let's start with warm ups. Warm ups aren't worth points in my classroom. We'll do that. That way, if it fails, it's okay. <laughs> Epic fail would be okay because it's not worth anything. So I started regularly involved giving kids choice in how they did their warm ups. Then, when that went well and wasn't a disaster, I went to note taking. Then it went to lar assignments at large. We started talking about how, I started talking to students about how I learned, how I was a visual learner, and I remember the reasons for the fall of Rome much better by this image, and then the reasons actually come later for me. But that may not be how they learn, and starting to talk about that. We started trying to create a common language in our classroom. We used the multiple intelligences as a, as a common language for us, not because kids have to fit into one of those things or not, but because it was a way to talk about how they process the information. Oops. And so we got rid of the box. We started taking students out of the box and allowing them to take ownership. Now, I had hoped and received that, that students were going to be more engaged. They were. I hoped that they were, and they were. But I realized that I was having less management problems. And then I realized that was because the arguing had stopped. I stopped arguing with students about whether they had clip art or hand-drawn images. Because all that really mattered was about the content. My rubrics had become more content-based and less format-based. I had stopped arguing with students about whether they were taking notes and how they were taking notes. Because I wanted to leave that up to them to remember for themselves that 
they could take notes. If they needed to write to process the information, that was okay. Or if writing was gonna distract them from getting the information, it was okay for them just to listen as well. Then, one day, a student came up to me. This student I'll classify as what I would call a stereotypical good student, who always did the work, was compliant, turned in everything, and she said, Miss St. John, I just want you to know, I really appreciate that you let us take cho have choice in how we take notes. I hate taking notes in those organizers that teachers give us. I hate them. She's like, I never fit into anything into them. I always have to spill out, and I just hate it. So I just really like that. Now that took me back, because I of course wanted to engage all my students, but part of the, the big push for me putting these strategies in place was to engage students who weren't typically engaged. But here was a student who was a compliant student who would have done everything I asked her, did well on things, and I thought that she was accessing the learning at the best. But it wasn't. She needed that choice too. And that really struck me. So a lesson that encapsulates my journey with UDL is this one. So I taught social studies, and it's broken down into units that focus on themes. And each of those themes, so this cultural geography, economics, et cetera, have principles that underlie the foundation of the unit. The students have to know it throughout the entire unit and they're assessed at the end. And this is what it looks like. Isn't it warm and fuzzy? <laughs> um, you can see it's monochromatic, it's text dense, it's really intense. And I struggled every year trying to figure out what's the best way for me to, to plan this lesson. So with the UDL approach, I took, put the ownership into the kits. They had choice for how they took notes. I did a very image heavy overview, but then the processing time was all theirs because we had built the foundation of thinking about how to process and they had a choice. So students had to create something that represented their learning. They could use Legos, they could use Play-Doh, they, um, they could draw something, they could write something, they could work with groups, they could work individually, they could work individually and consult with the group. They could do all of those things. Now, you know, students were more engaged, but on top of it, they did better on the assessment. And not only did I see on the assessment that they saw what I had taught them and what, what they had themselves created, I saw them pulling things and drawing things and writing notes on the side of the test that were from other students that they had shared with. And that was powerful. I have a two-year-old, and everything right now relates to Sesame Street and children's books. So this is Harold in the Purple Crown, if you've never heard of it, and he draws his way through everything. And so as I think of myself as a teacher trying to implement EDL, it's not about the strategies, it's about me putting in place lots of choice and lots of access points so that students can take their crayon and draw their own path to the learning. So, um, my name is Etna, again, I work for the Hyatt team, and we have the amazing and humbling experience of getting to work with teachers like Kim. And so we have to kind of figure out how to affect change for the teachers that we work with that are already working really, really hard. And the first point to make is that even though we are trying to influence change and change in thinking, um, the heavy work of thinking is, um, it's hard to, to do in the original stages, but the ultimate goal is for our teachers not to have to think about it, that it's so ingrained, it's just part of the system, and it's what they do, and there's really no work involved. So there's a beautiful dance of, of just integrating this automatically. So last year's conference, I'm coming out thinking, you know, we really need some teacher voice here. And even though it is way better to hear from somebody like Kim about what happens to affect change in thinking, I'm going to give you a, a couple of ideas of, of how we try to structure it and, um, and make it work in our, in our school system. So if you go out there and look for resources on how to Im impact change, it's like drinking from a fire hose. Um, there's so much out there, and I've almost drowned a couple of times. I'm sure we all have. But what we actually see in our classrooms is somewhere around these four modules. So usually it starts with the, the learn piece, some kind of theory, some kind of information giving, and it can be any format. We offer many, many different kinds, but there has to be some kind of ground. What is UDL? What, you know, why should I even buy into this? And then folks kind of tend to flip around between the, the next three, which is seeing it, doing it, 
and discussing it. And so seeing it can take a number of, um, uh, of different tracks as well. They can go on a learning walk, they can work with a peer, they can watch something online. In fact, we do a lot of webinars with them. Kim has done a couple with us. So we try and offer a lot of opportunities to see. And then the next step might be just do it. Just step in and take a risk and do something. And like Kim said, maybe do something that doesn't really matter that much, whether it's successful or not. Usually it is, and it's a springboard to the next piece. And then it's always bookended with discussion, reflection. How did that work? What went well? What didn't go well? Who's, who did I reach? What students are still on the margins? And what am I going to do next time to make it better? So this is sort of the, the four elements that we see teachers go through. And so um, what do we do in terms of trying to influence thinking? So we, we, we actually provide a lot of professional development opportunities, um, but trying to target the ones that specifically address change. I'll talk you through a few of them. The first one is relating to um, so courses for credit. We, we ran a three credit CPD course that we got approved through the state for credit and it had elements of the learn, do, discuss. You learn something, take in a resource, you do something in your classroom and then you discuss. And it's a year-long course and folks are required to enter into it every session three times to discuss what happened when they tried it. And even though it's relentless and people sometimes are a little, oh my gosh, it's, it, it's not going to stop. But at the end of it, it's one of the, rated as one of the most valuable elements in their learning process. We do a lot of learning walks. We try and bring two, three, four schools together so that teachers can actually go into classrooms, see it working, come out and discuss how would that work for me? What, what, could make, what can I take from this to make my work better? And then this big sneaker um, is trying to represent principles poorly, but we also bring principles through learning walks in a similar fashion because when teachers are in the classroom into implementing UDL, it can look noisy, it can look like there's a lot of movement in there. Sometimes we go in and we don't know where the teacher is. Guaranteed they're in there. But when a principal goes in, that might not be something he wants to see straight off. And we, we want to be able to show principals that this is by design, give them the language so that the teacher in the classroom is a little more comfortable with, with going out there and, how, and giving it a go. So the, the analysis slide relates to, we, tr we try to pull site leaders twice a year into a site leader seminar. And with that, we do a big idea exploration. The problems that people are having, success stories, we'll bring in problem solving strategies from the business world and just try and get them on the same page and they really can learn from each other. And the last picture represents a leadership institute. We sort of realized, you know, a couple of years in, you know, leadership is not really easy sometimes. If you're a change agent in your school, what are the skills you need to be able to examine people's beliefs, help them examine their own beliefs, and, and try and influence change? And so, what we have learned is we can see UDL. We do a lot of walkthroughs, we do a lot of observations, and we kind of think we have a process nailed a little bit. We go in, we look at the walls, we talk to the students, we watch the teacher, but you know what we've learned is we can't see change in thinking by looking. We have to see change in thinking by talking and discussing. And I think we probably haven't done enough of this, but I think it's our work going forward. And so, um, a couple of things that I want to talk to you about when we do talk to teachers. These are the kind of statements that we sometimes see. This came from a teacher. It's not our role to make students learn, but to create an environment where they can learn. And that came about in a one-on-one -on -one when we were look, talk, looking at the fabulous Todd Rose um, myth of average, and that wonderful picture, which I always stop at, the jagged learning profile with the student. And that was sort of her, her think moment. I'm like, that's, that's pretty cool. And one more think moment was we had a fabulous site leader in a school who was professional and passionate and really a hard worker. And she came up after a year into this. I sat down and interviewed her, and she said, I was skeptical. I used to think we were the professionals. We were trained to know what our students needed in order to learn. They had a heavy responsibility. Now I think the most important things for our middle school students are their autonomy and their metacognition. So some really good thinking strategies there. Linda? To, to follow on with what Edna's been saying about uh, teacher development, um, after hearing Kim's story, one could be tempted to put up a headline like this, drawing helps kids improve in social studies. You remember she said that her introduction to the unit was really heavy on, on drawing. Um, 
But that would miss the point, right? Even though partially true, it would be really misleading. This would be a better headline. Student scores improved after students were offered multiple pathways to learning. Something that gets more to the heart of what Kim really did. And like Etna said, that wasn't apparent just by walking in her classroom. If you look at the pictures she showed, if you walked into her classroom, you would see probably kids drawing and, and using a couple of other options to process the information. <laughs> but the, the thinking and the design behind it wouldn't be apparent without some of those other activities that Etna is talking about um, to gauge teacher change and teacher thinking. Um, but we never make that mistake, right? We, we know that UDL is about choices and about those choices being very deliberate offerings to overcome barriers for students and to provide students with multiple pathways. But at the early stages of UDL, a lot of people do think that providing choices or using some of the checkpoints is the end goal and not the means to that bigger end. And, you know, we really, we really have to think about that when we're training and developing teachers. So have you ever had someone ask or say to you something like this, um, when should I provide the choices and when not? Um, or what should I do about the kids who always pick the easiest choice? We get that all the time. Um, I, I've heard somebody say, I, I don't you do UDL every day, only when it actually fits with the activity that, that was in the curriculum. Um, and uh, I, I heard a principal say, well, you know, some of my teachers aren't ready for UDL, so we'll get there. Um, and, and those things are hard to respond to, right, because they miss the point. But yet, we also have to make sure that we're developing people, uh, we have to understand that under learning about UDL and understanding it fully is a process. So there has to be a start point. And like Etna said, sometimes the start point is just do something. Just do one of these checkpoints. Or like, um, like Kim said, start with something simple, do a little building block, and, and see how that builds something deeper. But we've got to make sure that when we're working with teachers, we don't stop there. We don't let them stop there and think, okay, been there, done that, moving on to the next thing. So this is what we need to see and we need to push teachers to do. We need to get them thinking about how to get their students to engage with content and how to remove barriers to success. And when they're doing that, we might see some of the same things in their classroom, but we'll know where it came from. I'm going to skip that one. So um, saying that uh, doing all the checkpoints is doing UDL is kind of like saying, if you use all the elements in the periodic table, then you must be doing chemistry, right? <laughs> it's not like that. So. What we really need when we're trying to convince people is that um, we need more research, more data, more articles, more things we can point to that we can bring to those people that we need to bring on board and say UDL actually does improve student achievement. But that's really tricky, right? And why is that tricky? Well, because now we have to have find a valid way of operationalizing UDL, right? And we said it already, the checkpoints are the tip of the iceberg. Um, the checkpoints don't mean UDL is happening. They're a tool to make UDL happening. So we've got to come up with some better ways to understand and know that UDL is happening. And like, like Edna said, we kind of know we're working with these teachers, we're going into their classrooms, we're talking to them. Um, we know that it's happening, but that's really hard to put down on paper, that it's happening here and not here. And then, of course, we have to remember that there's all these other elements besides what the teacher's doing in the classroom. There's the curriculum materials, there's the support from the district. All of those pieces come together. And how do we measure that? How do we operationalize that so that we can say that UDL is happening? Um, but this is where I'm really encouraged by Kim's results. You know, in, in this little microcosm of this one social studies unit, she thought differently, she put some things in place, she started teaching the kids differently, they started taking ownership of their learning, and guess what? They took the same assessment that she had been giving in previous years. This was not the first year she had taught that unit. And 
you saw how dry the curriculum materials were, right? Well, the assessment looked exactly the same. Am I right, Kim? <laughs> like, the assessment was another piece of text-heavy paper. And those kids took that very same assessment. And what had changed was not the tools or resources they had to take the assessment, but the learning that happened along the way and their ability to access that learning because it had happened for them in a way that worked for them with one of those pathways. Um, so Elisa's call to action for researchers yesterday really made me happy. Um, you know, because she, she really, th well, we had talked a couple years ago about research and, you know, let's pick a checkpoint and see if it really impacts uh, performance in some way. But that's not UDL. We can't do that. We have, to, we have to look at real UDL. And then, here's our other problem. We have to look at measures of success that actually measure the kind of behaviors and achievement that we want students who are educated in a UDL environment to actually demonstrate. And we know that some of our measures of achievement don't do that. They measure how well kids uh, sit for a long period of time and read and write for long periods of time. Not necessarily how well kids synthesize information, collaborate with each other, um, and strategically choose ways of accessing information that work for them. So I leave you again with this. UDL is not what you do, it's how you think about what you do. And how does that make you think about professional development, UDL implementation, or research on the effectiveness of UDL? Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you all. And, and I just want, wow, look at that. Wow. I'm stronger than I thought. <laughs> this green turned me into the Hulk, I guess. All right. Raise your hands. How many people are going to steal Linda's comment about the chemistry elements on the table, right? I mean, that was awesome. It's, it's those simple little things, so thank you for sharing that, Linda. I think it's, it's, it's a great nugget. It's just one of those things that's like, duh, it smacks you in the face, but you realize it's a great connection point, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, Kim, Kim, don't go away. Okay, so one of the wonderful things I get to do in being up on the stage is to, to represent the IRN in, in unique ways, and as I said briefly earlier, uh, a few folks had the opportunity to tour Rosa Parks Middle School for a model site visit. And Kim, can you come up here, please? We, uh, we wanted to honor, honor Rosa Parks and, uh, and give this to you on, on their behalf uh, as a, you know, recognizing them as a, as a model site for the UDL IRN. So thank you very much. Thank you, Absolutely. Okay. So everybody's tweeting out, right? You guys remember the hashtag? Yell it. What is it? All right. I think that's at least twice as many as yesterday, the last time I asked. So that's good. So our next UDL talk this morning. We have the pleasure of having Allison Posey here with us. Allison leads and participates in CAS professional, professional learning projects, UDL instructional and curricular design, and online course instruction using UDL. She also provides background in the application of neuroscience research into instructional practices. Her background in mind, brain, and education, as well as teaching experience in life sciences, neuroscience, psychology, genetics, anatomy, and biology. Did I miss one? That's all? Okay. Another ology in there? Okay. Uh, gives her an appreciation of the dynamic learning processes. She collaborates with teachers, researchers, and students with the goal of making complex topics accessible to all learners. Please help me in welcoming Allison. Thank you. <laughs> so
so I came home to Baltimore today or yesterday, which was really, really fun. A lot of my initial, my first year teaching was actually at Notre Dame Prep just down the street for those of you from Baltimore. I was 21 years old. My students were 18 years old. I'm short. I tend to look young. And when I first went into the faculty room, they were like, um, you're a student. Please get out of here. So anyway, it's great to be back. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm not a big dog fan, but I love this image because this is what I'm going for when I'm teaching and I want engagement. I feel like this sort of epitomized it. So here's here's where we're here's um here's our goal for today. Uh, purposeful design. Again, I love thinking about the design of the learning environments, um, and we're going to talk about it with engagement. I have a number of different ways you can engage with this uh, discussion. I've created a Padlet. How many of you know Padlets? Oh, great. So you can go to padlet.com backslash aposy backslash UDL IRN. I didn't quite match it up with the hashtag. I should have. And there are concept maps. There are steps you can do. There are resources. There are discussion questions. There's Twitter you can do. Um, you can do little post-its on that Padlet. So please feel free to join the Padlet at any point, and it will give you some options during this presentation. And often I say, are there questions? There are too many of you. I'm not going to take any questions right now. All right, our goals. Our goals for today. We're going to describe the central role of emotion for cognition. We've heard this. We're going to share it, and we're going to look at it again. And then I'm going to share a framework um, to observe and plan for the variability that we know we're going to have for emotions. So emotions are tricky. They're really hard to think about, to observe, and to measure. So I'm going to go out there and I'm going to see if we can figure something out. Um, and I also want you to take a moment to reflect on your own goals that you might have for this session. So we're going to talk about emotion and cognition and strategies to observe and look for it. So take a moment and think about what you might want to get out of this session. How does this tie to your work? You could post it, you could tell a neighbor, you could put it on the Padlet. So I have a student who continues to resonate with me. I know you all have had these students who, um, years later, actually it's been like 15 years, I still think about this kiddo. Um, it was actually here at the Johns Hopkins um, campus, the Homewood campus, and I was teaching a summer program um, at the uh, Center for Talented Youth, CTY. I was teaching neuroscience. I was teaching neuroscience from a college level textbook. This was a high school student. He was, um, th these courses are three weeks long. I would prepare all year for this three-week course, and these students would just devour the material. I mean, they went through it in an unbelievable way. Well, this student actually had read the entire neuroscience textbook in the first week. And I was a little bit like, really? You've read this whole textbook, and it took me six years to get through this whole textbook. But in the conversations that we would have and the questions that he would ask me, it occurred to me that, you know what? This kid really is reading, and he is processing, and I believe he's read most of the content in this textbook. And what startled me was the first assessment I gave was completely blank. He didn't answer a single question. And it was, um, it was a couple weeks later that I met his dad, and I found out he was failing four of his five classes in high school um, during the regular school year, and he was severely depressed. And I just couldn't believe it, because from what I could see and in my experience with him, he was not a depressed kid, and I would not have ever thought he was failing four of his five courses. So. Um, so this is something I wish if I had a time machine, I, would, I could go back and I could apply my UDL thinking to see what I could do to make this environment different and to also better understand the emotional state that this student was in when he was taking my tests and when he was experiencing my lessons. So this is, the, is, the, is my story that I'm going to use to apply to some of this other piece. So I'm going to use my UDL lens to be able to think about this situation a little bit more. I'm sure you have stories that you can think about. Hopefully, you'll think about. Um, all right, so in good UDL fashion, I'm going to start with the brain. If you take your hand and make it like a little fist, we've got our own brain models right here. So your arm is like your spinal cord going up. The representation networks are in the back. Your action and expression executive function are in the front. And if you open up your hand, those are your emotion networks. They are in the middle of everything. So you imagine incoming information coming in your spinal cord 
up here. They have to get through emotion to even begin to get to the higher order cognitive areas that are involved in just simple perception and strategies and being able to perceive everything. We have to get through, here's the emotion area all in the middle, we have to get through emotion. If the emotion is shut down for whatever reason, you're too stressed or you're too bored, you don't get to that higher order cognitive thinking. It's so powerful for me. You can just look at it on your hand and go, look at all those emotions and look at how important those emotions are. Um, so they are really heavily interconnected. It's not like there's one little dot, one little place as we learned yesterday morning from Neuromyths. There's not one little spot for emotion and you can just turn it off and check your emotions at the door. They are so heavily interconnected. We need them for everything we do. In fact, David Rose tells a story that I love. It's um, a research story that shows even, um, so if you're feeling a more emotional um, negative state, you'll even perceive the steepness of a slope to be more steep if you're more stressed. So a very simple perception is heavily rooted in our emotion. So it matters, emotions matter. And emotions are really hard to recognize. So I have two children. I've lived, they have lived with me their whole lives, and I think I know them pretty well. We went to Niagara Falls. Have any of you been to Niagara Falls? So this is an awesome experience, the cave of the wind. You actually go down underneath part of the falls and you get to walk around, and it's so loud and the water's crashing. And my son was huddled over, kind of going through like this. So of course I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this kid's miserable. He hates water, this is not good. My daughter is flinging her poncho off. She's screaming, she's like, yes! And I'm thinking, okay, she's happy, right? Seems very simple emotion to be able to read. When we get through, it turns out my son loved it. He absolutely wanted to do it again. And so I'm thinking, wait a second, this is my child. I can't even recognize emotion in him. How can I possibly recognize emotion in a class of 30 students at all these different points in the day? How can I do this? It's a huge challenge, but it's possible, I think. So we're starting to get better at communicating with emotions. How many of you use little emojis in your texts? Right, you could, I was going through the airport and right after the security check, they asked me how I was feeling with a little happy face or sad face. Right after you go through security and you're taking off your shoes and all this stuff, that's an interesting time to ask me where I, my emotion is. Let me tell you where my emotion is. Um, you can also detect emotion just from a series of 15 dots. So here's a person walking, 15 dots. This person's a little bit nervous. This person's relaxed. This is a happy walk, and this is a sad walk. So there are some emotions that we're starting to be able to recognize with 15 dots in humans. Now, there's not an all or none, and actually there's, you can go on here, and it shows a female walking, and they make their hips like swagger like this, and they show the man. And very, so it's definitely generalized, and we know that this is, um, this is, there's going to be much more variability than what we see on these 15 dots, but interesting to think that it's a starting point for being able to recognize emotion. So this is a valence arousal model, I actually like to say valence activation model, that's gonna help us to recognize the variability in emotions that we know are present. Some of you right now, you came in this morning and you were probably feeling, I'm doing all right, things are pretty good. So the x-axis here is basically good-bad. So you can just kind of do a little mental note. Are you generally in a good place? Or are you generally not so good? Traffic this morning, no coffee in the coffee machine. And then the part that I really like to think about beyond just good, bad, is in how active does that make me feel? There's no coffee, we're out of coffee and I'm really angry and I'm really energized. Or there's no coffee and I'm really kind of just bummed out about it a little bit. So um, there is this arousal element to it, which I love thinking about in my classroom, because let's say we say something like we're going to um, do a lab on photosynthesis. Some students are gonna be like, Bruh! and they might be in a really positive, really happy kind of Elmo-y place is what we put. And I tend to be kind of up here in this quadrant, a little bit Elmo-y. And then there are some students who are gonna be, ah, oh, that's cool, Miss Posey, we're gonna do a lab. Kinda happy about that. And they're in more of um, a Pooh Bear place. <laughs> then there are some who are a little bit more negative. 
and a little bit more stressed and tensed and I don't know what photosynthesis is and I don't like these labs and I have to work with this partner and it makes me more angry. And this is like Oscar the Grouch, at least the old Oscar the Grouch that I remember from when I was a kid and he's grouchy and really high energy. And then there's a negative and much more calm kind of eeyore place where things, and this is where I actually think that student Blake, it turns out that he was resonating more in this kind of negative space. So important to recognize you're not always in one spot all the time, right? There's variability in this. And so while I'm generally in Elmo, there are going to be some days and some contexts where I'm not gonna be so elmo -y. I'm gonna be a little more Pooh Bear. And it turns out my son tends to be a little bit more Pooh Bear. And that was really hard for me as a parent to think, come on, we're gonna go to the tot lot. And he would just be like, uh, okay. And I would think it was apathetic when in fact he was really quite happy about it. He just showed it very differently. So we tend to have a home base around which we generally hover, but in every moment that can shift. So again, I kind of think, I wake up this morning, things are pretty good. Oh, I'm giving a talk today. Okay, I'm getting a little bit nervous. And what you want to think about, how this starts to tie to UDL, is what is the goal? What is it that you have to get done? So let's say today, I'll just give a hypothetical. Let's say I woke up, I didn't have a good night's sleep, there wasn't any coffee, my hotel room was too cold, I'm in a little negative space. But I have to give a talk. And I know for me, giving a presentation is better to be in this spot, for me. So I have to start thinking about what strategies can I use to get myself where I need to be in order to achieve the goal. And my strategies are probably very different from someone else's strategies. For me, I like my alone time. I do a little yoga. I love to go for jogs. I looked at the flowers. So there are things that I knew I could do, strategies that I've learned, to get myself where I needed to be to achieve the goal that I had for this morning. And you all are going to have different strategies. You're going to be in different places. For some, I was actually talking with my brother, who was a professional ice skater. And he said for him to perform well, he actually liked to be in a little more of a negative place. That that really helped him to be a little more negative and a little more calm. So he knew when he was competing and having to do those big jumps and everything, this was a good spot for him. So he had to figure out how, where was he? And how could he get to that spot that was going to allow him to achieve the goal that he was intending? So kind of two questions that you want to think about. Oh, there are a lot of different models that you can use to think about um, these emotions. So the Yale, oops, sorry about that. Um, the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence actually has an app that you can download for free. And you can have students be able to very quickly plot where they are on this. Again, this is sort of the same x-axis about good and bad and activation, very energized and less energized. And it's a very, um, very cool site. We've seen paper post-it models. We do this at some of our institutes. We've seen these done in classrooms. Again, you can see the quadrants and students anonymously or not. Again, this is where you can, you can um, use what works well for you. Can just place little markers where they are and it just can help them start to realize. So let's say we're gonna do a lab today. Where are you starting? Where do you need to go to be effective at the lab work you're going to do? And maybe you find out you're gonna work with a partner and you recognize that that's not something that feels helpful to you. What strategies can you use to help get yourself in a spot where you can achieve the goals with your partner to accomplish that lab? It can be a great conversation piece between an educator, between the teachers and the coaches um, and the students to really help them Build, learn and build strategies. So you're probably starting to see how this is tying in really nicely with UDL. What's the goal? Where am I? Where do I need to be? And what strategies can I use to help me get there? And ba -da -da, that's where UDL comes in beautifully because you can start thinking about the strategies in terms of engagement, action and expression and representation that are in there. Um, and so for the example of Blake, I would love to be able to go back and say, okay, where was he? Where does he need to be? And what strategies can I design into the learning environment from the beginning for this test taking experience for all my students, informed by Blake, but for all students, so that they can achieve the goal that I needed to in that assessment. Perhaps it's a representation issue and I could have tests read, read aloud. 
perhaps it's an action and expression issue and I could have um, him record or all students be able to record their answers. Maybe it's an engagement problem and I could um, have a group collaborate around a practice test beforehand so then they see how they're able to, um, they're able to build strategies for how they can um, succeed on the actual test. So you can start using the UDL framework to troubleshoot and strategize design choices you can put into the environment from the very beginning for all of your students. So we encourage you to identify a problematicity. A colleague of ours at CAST uses this word and I love it. And I'm trying to think of how to get UDL in there, like a problem UD UDL in a tunity or something like that. So if you get an idea, I want to hear what it is, a problem UDL tunity. So it could be a problem around a student, as I've described with Blake. Like one educator said, I have this student who just wants to sit still and do um, independent reading. Or it could be a problematicity in a lesson. This photosynthesis lab is so boring and students don't do well on it. Or it could be a problematicity around a skill set, like persistence around a challenge. These can be your goals. This is where you're trying to get. Um, and you can, again, as you've seen me model, you can take this valence activation model and start thinking about what's the goal, where am I, where do I need to be, and what strategies can I put in the learning environment for all learners to be able to use from the very beginning? And you can't put everything in there, and it's not effective to put everything in there. And so that is why identifying the goal is so important, because it really helps you strategize what, what should be in there and what shouldn't be in there. And it lets you have conversations with students that you, don't, you wouldn't have had otherwise. So we often hear, and I'm sure some of you have heard this, this is too much, this is too big. I think I need to learn a little bit more first. And so what we're saying is just stick a toe in. You don't have to do the full jump. Stick a toe in. We're encouraging educators to really figure out what's just a little, oh, there I tried to do it. What's your little problem to udl -nity? What's your little thing that you're gonna do? And what did you observe and measure as being different when you started to incorporate a little bit of thinking, a much more self-reflection about um, affect and engagement, and different um, options for engagement, representation, and action and expression. What did you observe and measure? What would I have seen in Blake's test had I used this approach? Um, what would that teacher see in a student um, who needed to sit still during independent reading if some of these conversation pieces and design strategies were in there? Gather and share the data of what you saw and what you observed, and then iterate and build on that. So it's not gonna be a final, it's never, your lessons are never final, right? You're always changing them and modifying them. So in summary, what I'm offering is a proactive reflection and tool for communication that um, administrators can use with their faculty. So another time I'll tell you about a Super Bowl meltdown that I had one time, and I think had this sort of system been in play for me as an educator, it would have been very interesting for me to have been much more proactively reflective and communicative about where I was emotionally and the strategies I needed in February in the cold of New England during final exams and grades being due and what strategies can you really build for your teachers as administrators. Um, and it's supposed to be proactive design and I'm getting there, I'm so close. Context really, really matters. So these are the same color gray, the same color gray, but you put them in a different background and they look really different. So the goal is to put the burden on the environment. We're changing the environment, not the students, and what's essential for some is good for all. So we know this, these are core UDL pieces, and we're really trying to think about it in terms of the central role of emotion through new frameworks for thinking, and hopefully this tied a little bit to the goal that you had set out, to something that you wanted to learn about. Um, and so please feel free to share on that Padlet um, and have conversations um, now, at this point. I think that's where we are. Thank you very much.